This is lecture number 20 in the series, The ABCs of Communism, Bolshevism 2014. Um, the, uh, what we've been doing for the last five lectures is going through the history of the Latin American Communist parties. <clears throat> now we're going to skip, we, we've already gone through Mexico, Cuba, Nicaragua, Venezuela. Now we're going to go to Bolivia next for a couple of reasons. The first 17 pages of this book, of this chapter, I'm not going to go into in more detail except for these summary remarks. I'm going to get right up to the election in 2005 of Evo Morales. A new name uh, on the international communist landscape at that time suddenly burst forth and in the last 10 years we've had nothing but the most progressive developments out of the Evo Morales government in Bolivia. So. To get up to that point, let me just say that we have already covered the period of indigenous commu uh, primitive communism in South America. We've talked about how Bolivia and Peru were part of a central core area for the Central Andes and uh, as such were dealt with prehistorically and in the early Spanish historical period as one entity. Now. Evo Morales himself, the man that we're going to skip to for purposes of this lecture on the fight for communism in Bolivia, was a, a person born of what he calls mestizo background, meaning part Spanish, part Native American. Um, that's how he identifies himself ethnically, but uh, by phenotypically, that is outward appearance, uh, Morales looks exactly like the Native Americans of, uh, that he represents, which are well over 60 percent of the entire country. Uh, he was born on western, in western Bolivia in a little Indian village there and uh, in the department of Oruro, which is not all that important for you to remember except that in that particular department uh, they had a high school and a technical school and um, if a person uh, got lucky he might be on an educational path that would take him through those schools. Evo was uh, fortunate in one sense. He got sent to preschool almost immediately because his parents, in addition to having a little plot of land of their own that they farmed, sold their labor as agricultural laborers. And in countries like this, I know from personal experience, frequently the government and or the companies set up preschools so that the mothers have a place to dump their kids before they go to work in the fields. It was that way in the Bahamas when I lived there. Um, my daughter went started preschool when she was two and a half in Lyford Key because um, the Pindling government had made pre, pre, uh, preschool education available and of course all these women who are largely divorced are working in hotels and they need a place to drop the kids off before they go to work. So my daughter started preschool when she was two and a half years old at Lyford Key School. The same thing was true here in the uh, western part of Bolivia. Many of these parents had their kids in preschool at an early age. Now, the difference between Argentina and Bolivia at this point, uh, geographically and environmentally, uh, for northern Argentina is non-existent, so people would move back and forth um, 20, 30 miles without thinking a great deal about it. And Evo Morales' parents moved to northern Argentina to work in the cane fields there uh, when he was six years old. And he did what all little kids in his village did at that time. When they weren't in school, they'd help their parents with herding of the llamas. If they had sheep, they could herd the sheep a little bit. Evo had a little cart where he'd sell ice cream to people that, uh, along here and there, wherever he, he could get them to buy it. Uh, and that's the sort of thing he was doing. He went into his primary school now speaking for the first time Spanish because that's where the, how the school was set up in northern Argentina. Up until this time he'd been educated in his own language which was Aymara from the Aymara Indians. So now he's learning Spanish and he'll continue to be educated in Spanish schools on up through high school and military school. Um, this military school comes about as a consequence of his the fact that when you get graduate from high school you have two years of mandatory military service to do. So after he finished his high school work he uh, joined the army. Now he had a start on this already because one of his part-time jobs in high school had been to be a trumpet player 
for what was called the Royal Imperial Band, and this band traveled all over uh, Bolivia. I know when I first went to uh, this part of South America, I remember being woken up by one of the worst military bands I've ever heard, Ayacucho, play, playing some songs. Let's hope that uh, Evo's band was a little bit better than the Peruvian band that I saw in 1977. But at any rate, that's where he went in 77, and uh, he uh, uh, had gotten to know the country pretty well because the band went everywhere. When he got into the army, they stationed him in the Bolivian capital with the 4th Cavalry Regiment at the army headquarters there because he was uh, of the clerical type. He could read and write and was, he talked a lot and he uh, could use a typewriter. So they put him to work up there in the Center for Instruction of Special Troops in Cochabamba and also in this 4th Cavalry Regiment over in uh, La Paz. Now, everything began to change for Evo Morales when he uh, got out of his military service and he decided to go back to Cochabamba where his parents had moved um, at the, when the 1980s El Nino cycle started. They'd left northern Argentina and they'd gone over there to this Cochabamba tropical region along with about 250,000 other uh, people from that general area who had left and now were relocating there. Uh, by 1988, this population had increased to 215,000 from a start of about 40,000. Well, what did these Indians do there? Well, the biggest thing that they did there was to grow coca uh, at, on their farms, uh, coca being the plant from which powdered cocaine can be made. But in prehistoric times, this cocaine had been used for thousands of years and it was an essential part of the economy of all of these people. So no matter what they grew on their plots of land there in Cochabamba, they always grew a cash crop, which was coca. Because as Morales would say, we take this coke that we grow, these leaves, to the marketplace and we sell them. And that's the end of our responsibility. We don't convert this stuff into powdered cocaine. Powdered cocaine for private use is not something that was ever popular here in this part of Bolivia. And it may be in the big cities like Lima or La Paz, but uh, it's certainly not here. And we have every right to grow cocaine. And this was an entirely different approach to this um, question of legalizing cocaine or not. In other words, Morales was taking a position which was extremely popular among his people. Well. Of course, it didn't fit with the general line that the United States had been pressing about pushing for Bolivia, which was to suppress the cocaine trade. Uh, of course, Morales addressed that directly, saying that uh, this is the problem of the gringos. It's not our problem. What they do with this stuff up there in their own country is uh, their problem, and they don't have any right to come down here and tell us how to run our economy. Well, that, you couldn't get a much more dramatic division of opinion than that. Now, Bolivia was having a variety of economic problems. It's one of the reasons why uh, Che Guevara had selected Bolivia for his uh, attempt to start the general South American revolution that had led to uh, the war with the Guevaraistas in Bolivia and to the eventual capture and murder of Che Guevara himself. Well. What the Bolivian army wanted to do was to take over the cocaine business themselves. Now about this time I had arrived in South America, so I was aware of what some of the thinking among traffickers was with regard to this uh, U.S. war on drugs. Now, the way it translated in Bolivia was that the American government wanted, the U.S. government wanted the um, uh, Bolivian government to outlaw the production of coca leaves and everything else from there on up. And the army, Bolivian army, wanted to take over the drug business for themselves. So the two things worked out together. They could get the Boliv the U.S. Embassy got the U.S. got the Bolivian government to outlaw uh, cocaine at every level and sent the army to enforce it, which simply meant that the army now replaced the private entrepreneurial growers and intermediaries who would buy this sort of thing and then refine it into some kind of paste and ship it f 
for further shipment either to Colombia or to the States to be turned into powdered cocaine. So what it really was was a struggle between different factions for control of the, uh, the trafficking money. Now, Evo Morales started a, a little coca uh, growers union in the Cochabamba area. Uh, between 82 and 83, he became its uh, general leader. And uh, while this U.S. war on drugs was being imposed upon Bolivia, he was busy organizing all of the coca growers in the Cochabamba reason, region. If you if you remember the movie Scarface, you'll recall that Tony Montana was sent by Frank Lopez down here to Cochabamba to make a deal with the local uh, producer of uh, cocaine. And um, so you'll get a picture of what Cochabamba looks like. It's not like the rest of Bolivia, which is very high, dry, arid, and cold. Cochabamba is far enough down the slopes of the eastern part of the Andes that it uh, has a completely tropical appearance and atmosphere to it. At any rate, this is where the fight over the uh, right of the coca, coca workers, called cocaleros, to uh, do their profession was being fought out. From 84 to 85, Morales served as the secretary for this cocalero union movement. In 1985, he became general secretary for the entire Cochabamba region with all of the unions that uh, the Cocaleros had formed uh, as his uh, personal power base. And um, right off the bat, they started having bloody confrontations with the army, which uh, didn't have any intention of negotiating with the coca workers. They were going to take over the uh, coca fields the same way that the previous traffickers had, had run them, except now they were going to use their armed force to uh, enforce order as they saw it. So right off the bat, they got into um, armed conflicts, and Abel Morales distinguished himself in 1984 by being on the front line fighting these army thugs, and three of his colleagues were killed uh, right next to him. So he gained a great deal of respect, the kind of respect that a commander in wartime has from his men when they see that, well, he's right up here with us. Um, and so this struggle continued for the next four or five years. In 1989, another 11 coca farmers were murdered by rural guard thugs, which were financed directly by the U.S. government through its U.S. aid program. And those same guys, the next day after those 11 men were killed, caught up with uh, Abel Morales and they beat him um, and left him for dead on the side of the road. Well, while he was laying there waiting for somebody to rescue him, he says that he was thinking that maybe the only way forward is to fight a Cuban-style armed uh, conflict to, to get what we need here in Bolivia. But he uh, decided about the same time that he was going to give one more attempt to seize power in, um, electorally, which I think shows a lot of things. It shows that he wasn't letting a person let emotion take control of him, when most people would have said, as soon as I can get off of this goddamn ground, I'm going to go and kill these sons of bitches myself. But he was saying, uh, you know, we'll fight for our rights, we'll keep fighting for them, but we're going to try and do this electoral route. Now, so you've got a period here from 1986 until 2005, about 19 years of electoral struggle. I want to uh, kind of just point out a few things here, but one of the most important things is in 10 years into this electoral struggle, Morales uh, formed the Rural Laborers Union, which is the closest English translation I can give to a much longer name in Spanish that has the initials CSUTCB. And with that organization, he created an, a broad national organization he called ASP. Uh, the idea was for the ASP to be a political instrument for what this uh, rural labor union was doing in the streets, which was the rural uh, labor union was going to conduct the actual armed struggle with the police and the army thugs in the streets. They wanted to have a, a political wing. And that is what uh, they had they, they set up. 
something happened which was extremely important at this point, and that is that in 1995 the Communist Party of Venezuela finally got it together as an entity. I say finally because when you read the chapter in next year's edition you're going to see the long history of the Communist Party of Bolivia. But at any rate, they finally got it together and they brought three other left-wing Marxist parties into a front called the Left, the United Left. Um, IU in Spanish, Izquierda Unida. But at any rate, <clears throat> this was important because Morales was having a hard time getting his electoral movement off the ground. Now, what they had done and what they did do was that Morales had gone to a, a man that had a registered ownership of a political party that was still registered and on the ballot, or it could be on the ballot if it wanted to be, but who had kind of dropped interest in the whole thing. He had, uh, a, he had a registered trademark name of MAS, Movement Toward Socialism. Those are the, in, the initials in, in Spanish for Movement Toward Socialism. Morales bought that name from this particular guy named David Pedraza, or David Pedraza, and um, he made it into the, uh, he made AMS into the political name for the ASP. So now the IU ASP ticket could begin to, to grow. It got three percent, almost four percent of the national vote in 1997. In 98, after this Pedraza had sold the MAS name to Evo Morales, it began to uh, get involved as the legal, legal wing for what was going on in Cochabamba in the water wars. Now, <clears throat> these were wars over uh, the attempt by the, this same IMF gang that is trying to ruin Europe today in the Ukraine. The same guys with the same austerity program for the poor and welfare for the rich had um, privatized water. And that started a two-year-long struggle over water in the Cochabamba region. And that meant that in the 2002 elections, um, the Morales group got 21 percent now, up from 4 percent in their last time around, of the elections. The U.S. ambassador now, as the 2005, December 2005 elections were approaching, uh, the U.S. ambassador tried to intervene, threatening the Bolivian people that if they were to elect Morales, the U.S. would have to cut off all of its aid to Bolivia, which was kind of a joke because the only aid that the U.S. government was sending to Bolivia were bribes. They'd sent $20 million a shot to the Bolivian generals in the army that they were relying upon to um, carry out their work there. None of that money ever got down to the farmers, so by the, the U.S. ambassador saying he was going to cut off aid, that was uh, insulting and it was a joke. So it actually reacted against them. And what we saw in December 2005 is that uh, Morales won the elections with almost 54 percent of the vote, an absolute majority, for uh, which is one of the first times in Bolivian history that there, anybody had ever been elected by an absolute majority. And of course this is a man who uh, was an obvious Indian and uh, had a long history of far left struggles and was in alliance with the Communist Party. It was the Communist Party of Bolivia that gave him the intellectual brain trust that he needed to put together a program that he could sell to all of uh, Bolivia. In fact, they even were able to convince him to pick one of their own as uh, his vice presidential candidate. So there are a lot of lessons to be learned here, not the least of which is that even a Communist Party that has gone through a lot of bad twists and turns because of the khrushchev sino soviet split era can finally get it together and come back and play an important role. So the uh, details of how this are done, was done are in your book. And I think that you uh, probably will uh, learn a lot about that because some of what's happened there is definitely applicable to electoral strategies in any other country. And since right now that's one of the few things we have in the U.S. is electoral struggles that people could participate in, I think it's only a matter of time until somebody in the labor movement takes the lead and uh, 
puts together a true third party because uh, what we have now is one party with two wings, uh, an outright fascist wing and a not-so-fascist wing, that is the Republicans and the Democrats. Uh, the difference between them on foreign policy has not existed anymore. They're all behind this IMF uh, rule of world program that the Wolfowitz Kagan gang put together and which has steadily collapsed everywhere in the world that they don't seem to be able to get away from. So uh, in the next few years at least, uh, some of the lessons of the Evo Morales political campaign that lasted for 20 years uh, in election politics but may be of value to people that have something to do here within the U.S. And it may not, but I think it's worth your while studying it just to become familiar with Latin America overall. The movement toward socialism would become described as an indigenous-based political party that calls for the nationalization of industry, legalization of the coca leaf, and fair distribution of national resources. That's how they describe themselves. The party lacked the finance available to the mainstream parties, so relied largely on the work of volunteers in order to operate it. Now, I'm sure those of you who've had even limited experience in electoral politics know that getting volunteers and getting them out into the streets working the precincts is one of the major reasons to be involved in a political campaign to begin with. So they, it didn't really matter that they didn't have radio and television time to buy because uh, they had all of these this massive number of organizers. And this organization of these precincts continued up through 2004. In the December 1999 municipal elections, the movement toward socialism secured 79 council seats of the, in the cities, 10 mayoralities, and uh, they picked up another three and a quarter percent of the national vote, although 70 percent of the uh, voting, uh, out of 70 percent of the vote in Colombia. Now, these Cochabamba water protests that I mentioned, um, the Tunari Waters Corporation, uh, which was something set up by local capitalists in alliance with Ameri U.S. investors, doubled the price of water, resulting in a backlash from self-defense groups, including the Cocalero movement. And fighting with police and army thugs resulted in 2006 dead and 175 wounded. The violence forced the government to remove the contract from this Tunari Waters Corporation and appoint a cooperative to control the utility instead. So they had won that water war there in Cochabamba. Other protests broke out across the country in the next few years during which thugs and self-defense forces clashed with death, deaths occurring on both sides. But there was widespread opposition now to this so-called neoliberalism, which we've discussed before. Neoliberal policy is just a, the name that the IMF uses for the imposition of its austerity for the poor and uh, charity for the rich. Um, more and more of the Bolivian bourgeoisie were coming to see that all of this IMF program for Bolivia benefited just a tiny number of Bolivian families and of course the international bankers behind the IMF. And so they were, even though they certainly were not communists, they were uh, getting closer and closer to realizing that the day is going to come when we're going to have to support somebody against the IMF. And the one thing about Evo Morales is that he seems to be a reasonable person for a communist and uh, we, can, we can work with him. So more and more of the Bolivian bourgeoisie was deciding that the IMF program for Bolivia and the U.S. government program for Bolivia was more than they could handle and they might be better off trying to work with a, a, a native radical like Morales. Um, in the Andean high plateau of Bolivia, uh, there was a guerrilla uprising under the guy named Felipe Quispe. But he and Morales didn't get along, so Evo Morales used the mass protests to get across his message that the MAS, the Movement Toward Socialism, was not a single issue party. Instead, he said that MAS was arguing for a structural change to the political system and a redefinition of citizenship in Bolivia to include all the Indian groups and the whites. In August 2001, a military dictator imposed on Bolivia named Hugo Manzer resigned, and we talk about that in earlier parts of this chapter when you get to it. 
Quiroga took over as president. Now, this is only important because um, Quiroga tried to get Morales expelled from Congress. Um, he said that he was his language was had been so inflammatory that it was causing uh, violence in the streets and that a couple of cops had been killed as a consequence. So he was able to get 104 people to vote to expel Morales. But Morales counterattacked saying, this is not a trial against me, it's a trial against the Aymara and the Quechuas. These are the Indian languages. He grew up speak, speaking Aymara, learned Quechua later on uh, as he was learning Spanish. The, MS, uh, the movement toward socialism then gained increasing popularity relying largely on widespread dissatis dissatisfaction with the existing mainstream political parties among Bolivians living in rural and poor urban areas. Morales recognized this and much of his discourse focused on differentiating the MAS movement toward socialism from the traditional political class. This time the MAS campaign was very successful and as I pointed out before in the 2002 election they jumped from three and a half, quarter percent to 21 percent of the national vote. This made them second largest party in Bolivia and only one and a half percent behind the, the victorious party. Now that meant that Evo's party also had eight seats in the Senate, 27 in the lower house, and uh, that the threat of the U.S. ambassador to cut off aid to Bolivia was pretty much exposed for what it was. The presumptuous arrogant interference of the uh, great evil to the north uh, which would was only on in the interest of a tiny percentage. You could number, uh, you could benefit, you could tell how many Bolivians benefited this by counting them on one hand. So everybody else was against it, and Morales was increasingly being seen as a moderate among the far leftists who uh, were involved there. And uh, when the Communist Party stepped in to back him, uh, that really put a completely different perspective on everything. So, between 2003 and 2005, the natural gas conflict broke out in the Cochabamba area. Now, this was an attempt by the IMF government in Bolivia to um, sell, export its natural gas. And uh, that people of Cochabamba had no use for that particular idea, and they began to fight to overthrow that government in La Paz. Um, there were mass demonstrations from different parts of the country marching on La Paz um, and the threat of civil war in the country was very much on the horizon. So Morales began to travel to other parts of the world to try and get some support against the apparent attempt of the U.S. to intervene militarily in Bolivia to support the IMF government. So in November of 2004, he went to Cuba. He spent 24 hours with Fidel Castro. Uh, and then he met with uh, Argentina's president, Mr. Kirchner, whose wife is now president. In the 2004 municipal elections, then the MES had become the country's very largest national party with 29% of all of the city council seats in Bolivia. However, they still hadn't won the mayor's position in the big cities. And this inability to gain wi uh, widespread support among the urban petty bourgeoisie, who still dreamed of aping the gringos, was the biggest thing that Morales was trying to overcome. In Bolivia's wealthy Santa Cruz region, the one that we I just mentioned to you that is shown in the movie, uh, the Tony Montana movie, what's that called? Um, at any rate, the, uh, they failed to win in Santa Cruz, and that uh, that was not good. There, there. You, well, this was the last stronghold of the IMF supporters, and uh, who were strongly critical of the Cocalero movement. Um, and they were trying to get an armed insurrection started by bringing in U.S. troops, either formally or as some kind of mercenary force. In March of 2005, Mesa resigned, citing the pressure of Morales and the Cocalero roadblocks and riots. Amid fears of civil war, Eduardo Rodriguez became president of a transitional government, preparing Bolivia for the general election in December. So that doesn't give him very much time to reverse this situation of trying to win over the P 
petty bourgeoisie in places like Cochabamba and Santa Cruz. So, um, but, but they managed to do it. Measures were implemented to institutionalize the party structure, giving it greater independence from the social movement. In other words, the movement where you're actually involved in street fighting with army thugs and uh, private thugs, where people are getting killed and things are being burned and blown up, is one thing. The Morales Party wants to separate itself from that directly by having an independent party structure, which will allow it to say, yes, we support that movement, but we also have all of these other things that we want to uh, support, and makes it easier in the minds of people that can't support the Cocolero violence to support uh, the more, <laughs> what appears to be, moderate communist leadership out of uh, Morales' camp. With a turnout of 84.5%, this, this election, in December, saw Morales gain 53.7% of the vote. The closest guy was the incumbent, Quiroga came in with 28.6%, and that was the first time in 40 years that anybody in Bolivia had won an election outright with an absolute majority. Morales was widely described as Bolivia's first indigenous leader at a time when around 62% of the population identified as indigenous Native American. Political analysts compared Evo's election with the election of Nelson Mandela to the South African presidency in 94. Evo traveled first to Cuba to spend time with Fidel before going to Venezuela to spend time with Hugo Chavez. Then he traveled to Europe, China, and South Africa. You'll notice that nowhere in here did he make an obligatory trip to the center of the empire. Now, in January, that is, he'd won in December. In January 2006, to greet the New Year, uh, Morales did something which was very important to the people of that area. He went to Tiwanaku, which as you may recall, well, actually I didn't talk about that, but in the first part of this chapter, Tiwanaku was a uh, city, uh, an ancient kingdom, which at one time had been an empire prior to the Wari and the Inca of this part of the Central Andes. And there at this ceremony, he was crowned Apu Malku, supreme leader of the Aymara people, receiving gifts from indigenous peoples, that is, other Native American peoples, across Latin America. And there he thanked the goddess Pachamama for his victory and proclaimed that, quote, with the unity of the people, we're going to end the colonial state and the neoliberal model, unquote. Well, at that point, the struggle for state power in Bolivia was over, but the revolution had just begun. And that revolution, the last 10 years, we're going to cover in a, a 2016 edition when we bring all of the Latin American countries up to the present day. But when you stop and think about it, it's only been 10 years that Bolivia has had an honest government. Only 10 years that it's had a progressive government with a strong participation of the Communist Party. And um, that, and it's a, a country that's undergone, undergone tremendous modernization. I mean, just the fact that Bolivia has a satellite now that broadcasts news, radio novellas, sports events, 24 hours a day, to people that never had any kind of radio contact like this in the mountains of Bolivia, is is a great change to begin with. And soon it's going to be television. So they'll radio novellas will be telenovelas, and they'll. Uh, be the same thing that every other Latin American is watching, plus local news and, and, and international news from sources that are reliable, like the Bolivian government or RT, and uh, sports events, which are so popular, you'll now be able to see so popular in Bolivia. Now, in June of this year, I'm just going to make this comment because we've got a little bit of time. I think I can clean it up. The uh, current U.S. plot against Bolivia began to unfold. Now this Cuban intelligence report comes from a man named Hugo Moldis Mercado and it was published for a few days in Grandma, which is the official newspaper of the political bureau of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of Cuba, available daily in six languages or five languages including English on the internet. Uh, 
I saw it, I copied it at the time, and I'm glad I did because it was only up for a few days. Um, what they were reporting here was that, it's, he says, in a tactical shift toward Bolivia, the U.S. State Department has sent Jefferson Brown to the country, indicating a likely increase in subversive activity against the Morales government. Now, there's going to be an election next month. And by all polls and honest sources, Morales is easily going to win re-election. But the U.S. government and its troublemakers, that they like to call troubleshooters, are uh, trying to do something in Bolivia. And this is what the Grandma article was about. What is it that they're trying to do? Are they planning an assassination of Morales? Uh, are they planning a military coup of some kind? <coughs> well, it'll be hard to pull pull off a military coup because the army is very loyal to Morales and it's, uh, over the last 10 years he has managed to convert it into an, a loyal state instrument, I think. Now, at any rate, what he says is, this guy Brown was apparently sent to clean house and replace all embassy personnel in preparation for the Ju July arrival of a new attaché named Peter Brennan. This is an uncommon diplomatic practice. It appears that the White House has decided to make a turn for the worse in its relations with Bolivia. After removing Larry Memot, considered a dove in U.S. Secret Service circles, the State Department has sent Jefferson Brown, an interim business attaché, that's its cover, who will remain on the job only through June. In other words, he's one of those legal spies we were talking about in previous lectures. Uh, before handing over the position to much more experienced Hawk, this guy Peter Brennan, who's coming in as the new attaché. The reason we have an, 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 an attaché rather than an ambassador is because uh, Morales had expelled a U.S. ambassador named Philip Goldberg in 2008 for engaging with subversive activities of this kind uh, in conjunction with hardline opposition forces in the city of Santa Cruz. So now the U.S. Embassy is still there, but it has an attaché in charge of its daily affairs. All indications point toward the replacement of the entire U.S. staff in giving greater weight to the Secret Services and an increase in efforts to destabilize the Morales government within the framework of a regional counteroffensive. In other words, the Cuban Intelligence, DGI, Direction of uh, General Intelligence, uh, believes that the U.S. government is making a region-wide effort. I think that the, by this that they also include not just Bolivia, but uh, Peru, and probably uh, in the areas that are bordering Bolivia. You see, Bolivia used to be much larger and included most of what is today Paraguay, that is the Chaco lands. Those were stolen away in the early part of the 1900s by Paraguayan capitalists who wanted that land to grow cattle to sell to Argentine meat factories. The part of uh, Brazil, which is now Brazil but used to be part of Bolivia, that borders on Bolivia, uh, was stolen by Brazilian capitalists because they wanted the rubber. And so Bolivia lost all of that to Brazil. Then it lost the entire Atacama Desert to Chile, when, um, which was its only Pacific port. Now, in recent years, Peru and Chile have become uh, come to an agreement which I think is going to allow Bolivia access again to, to the Pacific Ocean through the Atacama Desert. But at any rate, these are things which uh, means that a regional wide offensive against Morales would include not only Peru, but the bordering regions of Paraguay, Brazil, and um, well, they probably were thinking about Chile before this uh, new government came in. They may still be thinking about Chile because people are setting off bombs against the new government in Chile who are almost undoubtedly being financed by the CIA. So this whole area is what they seem to have set their target on, um, according to the Cuban Intelligence Service. And that, of course, is something that Morales needs to be very well aware of. And I did see a recent interview of him where Ava Golinger um, uh, did it, and she traveled with him for an entire day. And you could see that he's well aware of the danger that is uh, presented to him by the what he calls 
always calls the Empire, and um, you know he knows perfectly well that they forced his plane down in Austria. Uh, he has no illusions about the nature of the U.S. government or what it's up to, and so I would suspect that the Bolivian part of their regional offensive is not going to work. And from my own sources, I think their Peruvian part of their regional offensive is not going to work either. I keep a pretty close eye on that U.S. Embassy in Lima, and uh, there's not much that goes on there that I don't know about. So, although they've been trying uh, to destabilize the Peruvian government for years, so far they haven't been very successful. and. Uh, I don't think they're going to be any more successful in the future. At any rate, the Cubans have been warning the Morales government about what the Americans are doing, the U.S. Americans are doing behind the scene. Um, on December 15th last year, a CIA team arranged the escape of a U.S. citizen named Jacob Ostriker. He was under house arrest facing drug trafficking charges in Bolivia. This operation in La Paz was led by Jeffrey Frederick Shadrach, the resident CIA spy who was provided cover as the embassy's political officer. He convinced Memot to help the individual, this guy, they, um, they, they got out of Bolivia, for humanitarian reasons without informing his superior of Ostriker's ties to the CIA. Although there were rumors that Memot did not manage the embassy's resources very carefully, the arrival of Secret Service auditors four days after his departure indicate that concerns went beyond bookkeeping issues. Jefferson Brown's actions thus far give some idea of what his assigned task entails. So this guy is supposed to clean up the, the financial mess that this fellow left behind. And uh, despite the fact that he's not scheduled to remain in Bolivia very long, he has been extremely busy. He's met with all of the opposition political figures and analysts, and uh, they have discussed the upcoming elections extensively. He visited the embassies of several other countries, and uh, the Graham article doesn't say which ones, but I don't think it'd be too hard to figure out. Their records indicate that the White House in the U.S. has decided to take a harder stance against President Morales, who is projected to handily win the up upcoming October elections, giving his administration and uninterrupted 14 years in power. Brennan will arrive in La Paz during the final stretch of the campaign at a time when Washington hopes the opposition will have put together a common front to prevent the re-election of Morales, who will go down in history as a revolutionary leader and as the candidate receiving the greatest electoral majority in the country's history, 54% in 2005, 64% in 2009, and if there's an honest election and no U.S. coup takes place, it will be an even larger number now in 2014. It's expected that Brown and Brennan will continue to work on uniting the opposition in Bolivia, but surely at the same time, they will move ahead with the strategy of engineering a soft coup, the new model of U.S. intervention based on stable destabilization as we've seen in Venezuela. Brennan has served second-in-command at U.S. embassies in Costa Rica and Nicaragua, playing a hardline interventionist role, as revealed in cables publicized by WikiLeaks and other news sources. In 2007, Brennan pressured the Costa Rican government of Oscar Arias to send the country's police to train discreetly, quote-unquote, at the U.S. Southern Command Academy. Given the military, or given the absence of military forces in Costa Rica, this was supposed to make sense. During the Enrique Bolas administration in Nicaragua in March of 2003, Brennan informed Chief of Staff General Julio Cesar Aviles that military aid to the country estimated at $2.3 million was to be suspended until the government destroyed all missiles and defensive military capacity assembled by the Sandinistas over the previous 10-year period. He was one among those responsible for maintaining political stability in Pakistan. <coughs> you know what a great job he did there. And promoted trips for youth from Pakistan to the United States to learn about democratic initiatives. 
Brennan's experience, like Brown's, in what are called democratic initiatives, national democracy, the actual UAE, involves most of the first time, the other state official. He took advantage of an official visit to discuss migratory issues to secretly meet with Cuban uh, dissidents whose subversive efforts are organized and financed by the U.S. government. As head of the Cuban Affairs Office, he worked on efforts to win the release of Alan Gross, a USAID contracted agent who was convicted of attempting to install an illegal communication system in Cuba and ser currently serving a 15-year sentence. With Brennan in charge of the Cuba office, U.S. aggression toward that country increased. The recently revealed mobile phone social network Zunzuneo, known as the Cuban Twitter, set up to promote subversion, originated during this period. Now, Brandon will be putting all of his work along these lines to experience, uh, in, to work in uh, 2014 in Bolivia. And what you can see is that obviously the U.S. is preparing some kind of offensive against Bolivia, but whether they can get it off the ground I think is uh, a matter that's still highly in question. We'll just have to wait and see. Having said that, we have kind of reviewed where Evo Morales came from uh, and why he was so important. I haven't said a word about uh, the buildup of the Communist Party in, in Bolivia, but uh, just to conclude, Bolivia and Central Andes uh, uh, and Central Peru are part of a Central Andean core area that um, until recently was considered by the left, that is by intellectual educated people on the left in both of these countries to be one entity. By recently, I mean until the post-World War II period. Up until that time, that is from, you know, recall that Broden came to Mexico in 1919 to form the Communist Party there and to give them instructions to form a bureau that would form Communist Parties in the rest of Latin America. Immediately thereafter, they recruited a Peruvian named Car Jose Carlos Mariategui, who, uh, that is, Broden left in 1919. Mariategui was in Mexico City along with all kinds of other people coming up there to see what was going on um, from Peru. He was uh, from Lima. And they recruited him immediately and said, for your education, we want you to go right now in 1920 to Italy. Uh, the common turn is going to bring the Communist Party of Italy. They're going to form it. It's going to become a member of the common turn next year, 1921. So Mariotti was the first of these people from the central core of the Central Andes that includes the intellectuals of Bolivia and Peru to uh, be recruited by this Barodin initiative out of the Communist Party of Mexico. And he was sent immediately to Italy. While he was in Italy, he uh, when he came back, he said he had acquired a, an education in Marxism and a wife. So he, he married an Italian woman and they moved back to Lima. Well, I've only mentioned that because Mariotti is the theoretical founder for the communist movement, not only in Peru, but also in Bolivia. And uh, we will, we'll, we'll pick this up in the 2015 edition where we're talking through each, uh, going through each one of those countries. But that's how communism started there. Now, I went through a whole series of things, 17 pages of which in this chapter I did not bother to go into because uh, I didn't think that was our major objective. What I wanted to do was to bring you up to speed, first of all, with the Evo Morales advent, which brought communism to power for practical purposes. There, uh, I can't think of any government programs that you could put into power in, uh, on it communist government in Bolivia that haven't been introduced under the Evo Morales regime. This is not a communist government coming to power in an industrial country. They're trying to build industry in that country and they have a good start because they've got tin mines and they've got a lithium, a huge lithium deposit. Uh, they've got a huge start in that sense, but in terms of manufacturing, um, they're, they're pretty much going to have to start from a very low level. So. They're, as far as I can tell, the Communist Party of Venezuela made the right decision by merging itself with the movement towards socialism of Evo Morales and taking things from there. Well, that's my opinion anyway. You can take it for what it's worth. 